Hey guys, welcome to And The Writer Is. I'm your host, Ross Golan. I've written with hundreds of artists and writers over the years, and my favorite part of each session is the first hour when we catch up about life, the industry, politics, composition, whatever. So this is a journey of learning why people write songs, how people write songs, and most importantly, who the people are who write the songs. I'm producing this with the great Joe London, Big Deal Music Publishing, and Mega House Music Management. If you want to listen to the songs we discuss in this podcast, follow us on our socials, find out about special live events, or buy that merch, aka that hat I always wear, go to our website, www.andthewriteris.com. For a little bit of context, we just wanted you to know that a lot of these were recorded before quarantine. And as we know, a lot has changed in 2020. So again, please stay safe out there and enjoy the new episodes of And The Writer Is. This week's episode is sponsored by BMI. At BMI, music moves their world just like it moves mine. BMI is my performing rights organization. They're the bridge between people who create music like me and the businesses that bring it to the public. They make sure I get paid when my music is streamed on apps or shows, played on radio, at live shows, or in bars, gyms, basically anywhere where music is played. And they do this for over 900,000 songwriters, composers, and music publishers with more than 14 million songs across genres. But it's more than that. They help us navigate the music industry. They create opportunities for aspiring writers and composers through stages at festivals, song camps, and workshops. And they connect us with the right people. They're also on Capitol Hill fighting for copyright protection and fair royalties. And they work hard to ensure the future of music. They have my back and they'll have yours. Learn more at BMI.com. Welcome to And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. Today's guest is a legend among legends, a producer among producers, a collector of Grammy Awards who define and redefine some of the greatest careers in music history. Even if all he did was co-write Man in the Mirror, that would have been enough. Or co-wrote all of Jagged Little Pill. That would have been enough. The list of his contributions is worthy of many episodes. But alas, there's only enough time to talk about... Wait, hold on. He also has opened and is opening multiple musicals on Broadway and West End. Who does this? This Mississippi native has entered the highest pantheon of pop music gurus. You ought to know this guest, and the writer is Glenn Ballard. Wow, thank you for that introduction. I don't know if I can live it up <laughs> or even live it down. There you go. But it's, um, it's happy to be, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. So um, let's start a little bit from the beginning. I mean, Mississippi, how does a Mississippi boy end up not in Mississippi? Tell me about your childhood. Who, who are your parents? Um, my parents were Mr. and Mrs. Ballard. In Natchez, mm-hmm. Mississippi, and spent a lot of time in New Orleans because my, my father's Louisiana native, and I'm about half French, so I have a little bit of the uh, Creole connection. So New Orleans was really, for me, ground zero for music, and even as a, a child, I was hearing music played all over New Orleans because it's it's one of the great music towns. So for me, the great influence was that music was being played by so many people in so many places for the love of music. So I think for me, music, being around New Orleans in my formative years, I realized that it was normal to express yourself that way and that there are so many great horn players in New Orleans on every corner, there's somebody playing. So it was it was kind of the inspiration of it, of making music not because you're trying to make money, but making music for the love of the music. Sure. So for me, music was always the fun thing I did. And who who got you an instrument? I mean, I could play the piano at an early age. I mean, I lost uh, my aunt when I was probably eight years old, and I inherited her piano. 
And it was the greatest thing she could have ever left me. So for me, just investigating on the piano from basically from a very early age. And I started writing songs right away because I was more interested in just creating my own thing. Do you remember the first song you wrote? Uh, yes, I do. It's called Fair Weather Man. I'm a go? fair weather man. It was basically saying I'm looking for sunshine. How, in my life. how old were you when you wrote that? Oh, I that? think I was about seven. You were seven when you wrote yeah. it and you still remember it? Yeah, I still did, remember it. Did you play for your family and stuff or were you actually yeah, I, starting to play it I, outside? I, I the drove house? my family crazy because I, would ne- I didn't know any other songs other than the ones that I was writing. And they would always say, play me something I know. So my parents' favorite song was Misty. So I learned how to play Misty. Look at me, I'm as helpless as a kitten up a tree. So, but mostly I just wanted to write. And it... There's nothing more boring than hearing somebody write a song, you know? And so that's what I would do in front of my family, and it would be like the doors would all slam. So for me, it was like a lonely thing of like creating my own music. When did you start playing outside of the house? Well, I had a band in the fifth grade, the Rogues and the Esquires, and we we played shows every weekend, and we were making $200 a show. Wow. Yeah. At, the, in, yeah. at that age? At that age. And then in so junior, you guys were actually pretty good then. We were really good, and we played mostly Crazy. original material. So for me, I've never, never been in a cover band. And so on every level, for me, I was always making sure that people heard my music. <laughs> and it's... What did it sound like? It was, it was kind of rock. It was rock-oriented. It was loud. I played guitar in the band, even though I was a piano player. But if you have a rock and roll band and it's the 60s, you need to have a guitar. Yeah. So that's essentially why I got the guitar. And, uh, of course, the Beatles were a huge influence. So we just played music. And what I realized from that was whatever money I made doing that was more valuable to me than making money from any other source. So that was it. I just wanted to figure out a way to make music and somehow get paid. So, of course, being in Mississippi, there's not a lot of... Or New Orleans, you don't make a lot of money making music. You just make great music. So it's either go to L.A. or New York, and I I picked L.A. for the weather, and it kind of worked out for me. Did somebody say to you, you have to leave New Orleans to make money in music, or did you intuitively know that it was time to get out of... Well, I... I, The truth is, I, I went to... Ole Miss undergraduate, and I studied literature, and I had a fellowship to go to law school when I graduated, and the day I graduated, I got in a car and drove to L.A., and I never went back. Crazy. I still haven't gone back. Did your parents accept that decision when you were, yes. you know, they didn't even question They that. already knew that I was going to do my own thing. Yeah. Did you think you were going to get in... You knew you were going to be involved in the creation of music, though. You were never going to get involved in the business side. I mean, even having having even got a fellowship going into law school and then going to L.A., there are as many people who do that who are, you know what, I'm going to get involved in the business side of music. Well, I did get involved with the business side of music unwittingly because within a week of my arriving in L.A., I had the good fortune of essentially working my way into a gig for the Elton John organization. They had just opened a record company in L.A. called Rocket Records. And Elton had moved to L.A. He moved his band to L.A. And through a a chance meeting of somebody at Sunset Sound Recorders in L.A. who was going to work for for Elton, I I just sort of tagged along and helped her and, and sort of insinuated myself into the whole organization, started answering the phone for them, started moving boxes, and suddenly they hired me about two months later. So I was answering the phone around Rocket Records in 1975. and uh, so Where were you living in L.A.? I was living uh, in Beverly Hills, believe it or not, but it was in a very tiny apartment that I had talked my way into as a building manager. You, you have to have a hustle to, to get going. If you don't have a hustle, forget it. Because you got to invent this shit every day, okay? Yeah. And that was my thing of like, let's, l- let me figure out a way that I can be here and continue to make music. 
Yeah, I feel like a lot of new writers, that's the, you know, the biggest question we get asked is sort of, what do I do next and how do I get my songs to people? And the answer is, I don't know. And no one has the answer to this. You make these relationships and you have to get it to these people. I don't know how the hustle happens. You, you, you know, you find your apartment and you find your, your job and you just keep meeting people. But as you get into the job and Rocket Records, Weren't you tempted to start giving opinions on composition? I, I wisely waited about a year before anybody even knew that I was a musician. How did you keep that to yourself? Well, I mean, because there was, there, was, there, was to too, there was too much to do. You know, there was yeah. too much for me to do. And they, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story about a great songwriter. In 1975, I'm sitting at 211 South Beverly Drive. And a young woman walks in with a cassette player. I mean, a cassette tape and says, I have a song for Elton John. And I'm like sitting there going, uh, okay, do you know that he writes his own material? And she said, I don't care. This is for him. She left it with me. And I, there was no way I could play it for Elton, but I put, just put it in the pile of whatever. It turned out to be Diane Warren, who has written more hits than any of us. Mm -hmm. And she was already, she had her hustle on of like, I'm going to take my song to Elton John. And that's how she did it. And it was like a direct line, however I can get there. So I was always inspired by that. And we've, we've remained friends for now 45 years. And we always remember that day. What is it, first of all, when you're doing another job, how do you keep up your chops? Are you actually still playing at all? Did you oh, have a keyboard? I, had, you just I rented sleeping? a piano. It was, it was essential for me. Most of my money went into renting this upright piano. So I... I had a tiny apartment, but I had to have the piano. And this is sort of pre-digital. So you needed musical instruments to make the noise. So I actually had this, I rented this piano and it ended up being everybody's favorite piano. Uh, the piano, uh, the keyboard player in Elton's band was a guy named James Newton Howard. And he it, finally, about a year into it, he heard me play something and he went, hey, dude, you can play. And so I started doing demos for them and they put me with Kiki D to write some songs. So I just by being patient, I think. Uh, you have from 1975, you know, you have like five, seven years where you're starting to get some credits as a keyboard player and playing on some records. Um, how are you starting to get infused into that world, and then what's the difference between that and when you actually start writing with people and, you know, before we get to the first hits, you know, what what's the process of going from, okay, well, I like this job at Rocket Records, but I'm actually a, a really good instrumentalist, and I, I could actually do some work on these Well, I was working every albums. night, every every penny that I had went into making demos or to renting instruments or buying instruments. So I never stopped creating. Making I, demos as you would write and produce oh, your yes. own songs. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I never what? I, uh, I did hundred. I've literally made hundreds of demos. What were you making the demos on? Or were you renting? I would rent studios. studios. Oh, I, would, yeah. I would find studio time. Um, at that time in LA, there was probably 200, literally 200 recording studios because you couldn't make a, a record in your bedroom. So I knew them all, man. I, and I, you could go in a lot of these places at midnight yeah. and, and work a deal for a hundred bucks. You could stay there all night. Is the so small did, room at the village up at the top? Yeah. <laughs> well, there was a room at Sunset Sound Recorders. The owner of the studio, Tutti Camerata, who was a great arranger himself, was so sweet to me. So he gave me this little room over there whenever it was available. So I did hundreds of demos, constantly trying to to get better at it, really, to get better at... It was even, that frustrating, or is it sort of, no, this no, is just no, a process? No, no, it was fun. Yeah. It was fun. I mean, and my attitude was, I'll, I, I'll work with anybody if they're enthusiastic, let's do it. Who is encouraging you in L.A. as far as songwriting goes? No right? one. So no what one. keeps you going at, at some point, you know, who are you sending these demos to? Are you doing the Diane well, Warren thing? Are you I, walking up to people? And I would go to publishers. Yeah. I was trying to get a publishing deal. Yeah, and I remember going to Irving Almo, and cool. I, there's <laughs> there was a publisher in there who I played them ten songs, and they 
They said, this is the worst shit I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Do you know who it is? <laughs> yeah, but he shall remain nameless. Yeah. He's out of the business. Uh, but at the same time, it was, a, it was a bracing reality because the songs that I had given them were really for an artist, me uh, the artist. But I wasn't going to be the artist. So it was on some level, the biggest thing for me was to say, okay, I'm not going to be the singer even though I can sing, I'm not going to be up on stage. I would rather just have other people do it. And I made that decision really early, like when I was probably 23, to give up being the artist and and empower other artists because I just didn't feel like that was what I should be doing. I just knew I needed to make music every day. And first of all, I couldn't make music every day for my just for me. So having the re- the early rejection as a songwriter it made me first of all focus on if you're going to be a commercial songwriter what it is that you got to do to to make it interesting to other people and at that time you could as a songwriter find scores of artists who would do outside songs as a routine so it rarely exists now but it, it by 19 okay my first song that I got recorded is all because of Davy Johnstone, who's the guitar, he's still Elton's guitar player. He and Kiki D were in a romantic relationship at the time. I'd written a song with a fellow songwriter named Tom Snow called One Step. And Davy loved it. I had a little demo and he played it for Kiki. She liked it. And that was my first song recorded. And they, it was produced by Bill Schnee over uh, at Cherokee Recorders. And it was like a mid-chart single. And so I was still working at Rocket answering the phone. And a man named Leeds Levy called me from New York. He was at MCA Music Publishing. And he said, uh, I'm looking for the writer of this song, One Step with Kiki D. And I said, hey, dude, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> he said, really? <laughs> yeah, I'm answering the phone, but I'm also a songwriter. So um, he said, well, I'm interested in that song. Um, Would you be interested in talking about maybe being a songwriter for, you know, as a a staff songwriter? And of course, this is the music to my ears. So I got hired at $100 a week from MCA Music Publishing to be a songwriter. and I'll give you $200 a week right now. <laughs> and I'll take it. You got a that's deal. That's inflation, right? <laughs> <clears throat> um, that's incredible. Yeah, so, that's my story. Um. Just starting to jump because there's so much to get to. But you, the first song that I see that's like a real hit is the George Strait song. Yeah. You look so good in love. Yeah. Um, You know, for somebody from Mississippi, that makes sense. For somebody in LA, that does not make sense. It makes no sense. How is your first number one song a country song? It was the second country song I'd ever written in my life, first of all. And it was because of a guy named Rory Burke, who's a Nashville songwriter. We wrote that song on the lot at Universal Studios because that's where I was as a songwriter. And so we wrote this country song over on the lot and we did a quick demo. And I, about three months later, Rory Burke called me up and said, this guy George Strait wants to cut our song. And I mean, who's George Strait? I knew nothing <laughs> about country yeah, music. I mean, zero. Yeah. And then it ended up being one of his biggest hits. So I'm forever grateful, but I'm completely naive to it. You know, it, it was not a plan. My first really successful single was a, a country song too. And we just started going to Nashville all the time. And it was starting to get the pull of like, why aren't we living in Nashville when clearly there's, there should be some sort of, you know, desire to cut songs in Nashville for things that I'm writing. Um, I Turn out that still, like when it comes down to it, like you're in LA and you just write songs that you want to write, and it just happens a country person cut it. But were you getting the pull to go to Nashville? No, I just felt like Nashville, from a musical standpoint, felt limiting to me. And I, some of the greatest songwriters are in the world there, but the kind of music I was writing was a little more chromatic, and it just didn't, it didn't, I couldn't get away with it there. Mm. So I've always tried to write music a little bit outside of the box. That's my thing. I, I, I love rich harmonic structures, and yet I love songs 
that deliver. So for me, I think if you describe my songwriting style, I'm trying to create songs that are memorable, but that are easy to digest. Sure. Well, speaking of easy to digest, so All I Need by Jack Wagner, it becomes sort of the first big pop hit. Um, the, the difference between a country hit and a pop hit now is much different than it was then, where I feel like country records sold a lot of, you know, George Strait was selling a ton of albums. And you were probably making a lot of money on a George Strait single. And a Jack Wagner song, which was a, a you know, a top five, top one, top two pop song, m means something different. But it doesn't necessarily make more money in the the pop world then than it did in the country world. I guess that my question is, Were you encouraged by the pop song having that kind of success? You know, how did you feel like the comparison? Because at this point, you have one country song, one pop song. And how did you feel about that era? I, well, I didn't think I would be writing any more country songs. I just thought it was like a, just an accident, really. Yeah. Yeah. So, and at the time of the Jack Wagner thing, I was actually, uh, I was a staff producer for Quincy Jones. And... It was just a gig I was assigned. How did you become a, a staff? Well, because I, I worked on a record, uh, a George Benson record in 1980 called Give Me the Night. And I, I had written really a jazz song for it called What's On Your Mind. And that was my first really big record. And Quincy recorded it. And that's when I met Quincy in 80 and Rod Temperton and the whole Quincy team. So... Quincy just dug how I did it. He liked my demos. He liked my writing. And he hired me. He, he, he had a big record company. He had a bunch of artists signed. So he said, I want Glenn Valor to do it because so, he can write and produce. So one of the first things we got was this guy on General Hospital, Jack Wagner. And we had to write some songs basically that he could perform on the show. So it was really TV that got that song over. It was all, wow. about, t it was all about television. And so I, I saw the relationship between how powerful TV could be if you, if you paired that with the right record. And it, was, it went through the roof because he performed it almost every day on the show for almost two months. Did that, um, you know, once you start having success now in L.A., because the, the other success you're having was sort of all over the place, but this is now like a, a television hit and Excellent. radio hit. Are you getting pulled in all kinds of directions and are, are opportunities starting to flow your way or is it sort of going through Quincy still? It was still so going through Quincy. I was, um, I made records with Evelyn Champagne King, Teddy Pendergrass. I did uh, a, br a he, he, he even had uh, some really crazy British experimental music on his label. Uh, I worked with a band called Philabelia, which didn't end up being a hit, but they were a Manchester sort of English pop rock group. And so Quincy was just embracing all kinds of music and he needed people to, to help him execute it. So that's what I did for three years. It's the greatest education I could have ever had, you know. For someone like Quincy, who's, you know, maybe one of the greatest arrangers of all time, you know, and he's at this point working on the the new stage of Michael Jackson. Um, are you trying to get into that, to the Michael Jackson world? Were you actively trying to get involved in that? Or is it sort of, that's not how you work with Quincy, you just do your thing I, and No, I was it. actually, I was, I was involved because it was like a family. So I, I was involved with Thriller. I, uh, I wrote a song for Thriller And Michael and I demoed it. It was called Nightline. And it almost made it on the record. And then he, it was like one of the last things. And then Michael came in with two new songs. One of them was called Beat It. And the other was called Billie Jean. And it was like, shit, those are much better than this song we've got. So what is it like to see, you know, Thriller obviously having that kind of success. You hadn't had anything like that. And you see that and you were... This close. Yeah, it was that close. What did it, you know, how, how did you deal with that? I never lost a night of sleep. No. I never lost a night of sleep because a lot of people ask me that question. I went, look, if Michael had come in with some songs that weren't very good to replace mine, I would, I would have felt bad. But 
Billie Jean, are you kidding? Yeah, right. It was like that one deserved it. It earned its place on the you know on the squad. So I was cool about it, you know, and it ended up working out for me because I got on the next record with another song. You know? Yeah. But, so let's go to that song. I mean, you know, you write with Sierra Garrett. Yes. Um, you're doing this. I assume it's just a regular writing session, right? Just yes. the two of you? Because there's no, you know, it's just you two as the co-writers yep. on it. So right. you're just sitting in a room thinking, were you aiming for Michael Jackson? Yes. Oh, we wrote it for him. So you were aiming for Michael Jackson. You're thinking, this is a cool concept. We're, we should do a worldly song. Or was it not intentional? It just happened where he is in his life that Man in the Mirror becomes that. Well, first of all, Saida Guerra, who's an incredibly talented woman across the board i mean there's almost nothing she can't do i first met her she was recommended to me to as a demo singer so the first two years i knew saida i she wasn't a writer she would come in and sing my demos and quincy jones heard her singing and went who is that mm. so he had already identified her as somebody he wanted to work with as a singer background singer whatever and so Throughout the process of the bad record, I was, you know, heavily involved with Quincy and all of it. Michael, I was, a, I was in the studio making that record, helping him make it. And I wrote like eight songs for the record. None of them, you know, they were all up-tempo songs, like trying to do the dance thing. And it was like, whatever. None of them worked. So right near the end of the record, Saida called me up and, and she had subsequently showed me that she could write lyrics and I had no idea but I'm really open if somebody can write they can write so it was like oh my god you can really write so she said let's write a song for Michael I said okay let's do it I said by the way I've already struck out a million times on this but if you want to try it so it was like the last ditch effort it was a Saturday night she called me up I had plans she said we have to do this for him and so we sat down and wrote it in a couple of hours. I just sat at a Fender Rhodes, and it just happened right there. She wrote most of the lyric. I wrote some of the lines. I don't know. It was just a magic and moment. How soon from Saturday night to when Michael cut it? This is this is where I, God bless Saida. She took it to Quincy. Would you have taken the, it to Quincy? No, never. I would have just like turned it in and like she called him up on a Sunday and said, you got to hear this song. You have to yeah. hear it. You have to hear it. So she insisted her way to his house up on Bel Air Place, played it for him. And I got a call from him saying, I really like this. I'm going to play it for Michael tomorrow. He played it for Michael the next day. Yep. So on Tuesday I was in, I had the whole song programmed in a Lynn 9000. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd written it in A flat, and which is a key I love. And... So we sat in with Michael at Westlake Studio D and he said, let's drop it a half step. So we dropped it down to G, but I still wanted to get to the A flat. Cause the, and so we did this half step modulation like halfway through the tune and jumped it up a half yeah. step. And Quincy said, I don't know about that. I said, no, let's do it. And then why, went, do you yes. like, why do you like A flat? It's just a rich key. Uh. It's just a rich key. I love that, that that's the reasoning for doing the modulation oh, yeah. is because you're like, well, I'm you going to get there. there. <laughs> you have to get back home. <laughs> that's so funny. And then, you know, I had, um, I had this long outro, which I was getting ready to chop off because I didn't really have anything going on there but music. And Michael said, no, 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 no. Let me have that real estate. I know what to do there. And man, did he ever know what to do there. The last two minutes of the song are my favorite part of it. And that was just taking the riff... Then we added the choir, and then Michael just going off, you know. In 2020, if that's done now, Quincy's a writer on it. Michael Jackson's yeah. a writer on it. Yeah. The runner's probably a writer on it. You know, um, at that time, you write a song, and it's lyrics, melody, music, you know, chord changes. And if an artist did their, you know, interpolation of certain parts or interpretation or improvisation, whatever they did on it, that that was a contribution to the song, but it didn't make them a songwriter. It made them an artist. Um, why the biggest artist in the world, 
maybe the biggest writer, the you know, artist of the last 40 years ends up singing on the song. Why did he not take songwriting credit? Because he didn't write it. Yeah. He didn't write any of it. Yeah. But he brought his artistry to it in, in a way that elevated it way beyond what it was. Totally. So, it, but at that time, there was a lot of res- a lot more respect for the, the integrity of the DNA of a song. Sure. And I mean, look, if, if you'll put I mean, this reflection on what's happening currently, so much of the pop music is um, it's about the track. It's, and the question is, does, it survive, does the DNA survive separated from the track? That's always my question. Yes. And for me, it's always about if I can sit down and play this song on a piano or a guitar and it will survive. If it survives that, then it, the DNA is strong and it's not dependent on just the track. So, so I don't know. I don't know how 10 people write a song. I don't know how that works. Um, you know, that song, that song is on a whole other level than, you know, almost any song that any of us can get connected to. You know, Man in the Mirror becomes worldwide, and by worldwide, I mean like small villages throughout the world are singing this song. I mean, at least that, that was the public perception. What, how did this experience of having Quincy produce your song like this influence the way you produce records? I mean, I... Quincy is always, you know, the the one I look to in terms of his process. He was always so positive and loving in the studio. He empowered everyone around him to do what they did, and he, he never micromanaged any of it. His attitude was, I want to get the most talented people in a room together, and shit will happen. Yeah. And he allowed it to happen. So... When we worked with, with Quincy, all of us, all of the musicians, all the singers, we just loved being there. I never wanted to leave. Yeah. I mean, at Westlake Studio D, they had showers. There were times <laughs> I was in there three days at a time because it was also much harder to record multi-track back then. Michael usually wanted like 30 tracks of vocals to do his backgrounds and we would have to make that real estate. So, Crazy. you know, I'm dating how myself. Is, how was your relationship with Michael? It was great. He was, I never saw him outside of the studio, but in the studio, he was enormously patient. A lot of people are very impatient. They want it right now, but it took a lot longer to make records then. Yeah. And so he, I just remembered that he, he would dance two or three hours every day out in the studio and I was always mesmerized because he was, he was so dedicated to that, that art form. This week's episode is sponsored by BMI. Full disclosure, Joe and I are both BMI songwriters. So we didn't write this, but we believe it. BMI, we celebrate your talent, value your music, and champion your rights. To all our songwriters and composers, your passion is ours. BMI, music moves our world. You leave having you know this massive success with this song just new level you could have worked with any artist on the planet you certainly could have probably gone in with as far as females at the time you know madonna probably the bangles whoever else is really big at this time and you go in with paula abdul (laughs) you know paula paula didn't have anything yet what did you see in paula that was worth following up working with people like Michael Jackson that you go in the studio and do Forever Your Girl, you know, that's, that's a, an interesting choice. You could go somewhere where the floor is much higher. I, I look at everything just as an opportunity to make music. And that was, it, first of all, it was a good gig. It was a good paying gig. And Virgin Records was a fun place to make records. So it was just a fun thing for me. I, I didn't think of it beyond that as, other than she was wonderful to work with, easy to work with. She was not the most gifted singer, but it was, a, it was about entertainment. So yeah, it's definitely not Man in the Mirror. Uh, no, but I mean, it's so successful. Yeah. It was so huge. Did you feel, having gone from doing 
the venerable artist now to breaking new artists. Did you start preferring one or the other, or it doesn't really matter? It didn't matter. But for me, the most fun, obviously, is is it coming out of out of the darkness and in being this bright light. Uh, and there's nothing more satisfying than that. And so I, I, I was involved with that a little before Paula uh, with a group called Wilson Phillips. Um, and again, that my thing is I'm kind of just a natural counter-programmer. When I did the Wilson Phillips record in 1989, they were originally signed to Warner Brothers for records and they wanted them to abandon the, the, the pop thing and do dance record. And so I got a call from China Phillips saying, we're not going to do this deal. We want to work with you because I had done these demos with them that were pop. So I really am grateful to them forever for having the artistic courage to walk away from a record deal at Warner Brothers and to just come continue to work with me and they didn't have a deal. So we had four demos. One of them, it was called Hold On, You're In Love, Release Me, and one other song. And they're all number one records ultimately. But no one wanted it. No one wanted it. So somewhere along the way, a great impresario named Charles Koppelman had just put together a great deal, sold a big publishing thing to EMI, and they gave him a, a label called SBK Records. So he had a brand new label and he was, again, one of the few people who liked what we had done. And so he took an artistic chance with this three-part harmony pop song group at a time when nobody was doing that. And he, he said, I'm going to make it a hit. And thanks to Charles Koppelman, it was a hit. And we, we had huge success with that record. Yeah, I mean, that's a, even, again, a level up of you you break an artist like Paul Abdul, and that sits in this this specific lane. But Wilson Phillips sort of goes across all different age groups yeah. and becomes m- even more successful, gets nominated for a bunch of Grammys. Um, does that, how did that influence, you know, y- the choices you were making even further from that? Does that... Did it make you want to be involved in, well, here I have these demos for some unsigned artists. You could sign your own artists. You know, did you start feeling, you know, I, I don't know how that makes you feel when you go from taking, working on demos for an artist, them almost having a record deal, throwing those demos away, then going somewhere else and becoming successful, like you were saying. Didn't, did you ever feel like releasing it yourself? If this is 2020, you would just say, fine, I'm going to release I'll it on TuneCore. Yeah, exactly. You know? Oh, no, you, you needed a gatekeeper. You needed, there was no way to distribute your own stuff. No but, you were, but you were one of the, in a way, I would assume most of the labels would give Glenn Ballard. I mean, you end up having some, you, you do end up releasing some music. So I guess what I'm getting to is when did you start thinking as I'm going to have my own imprint, my own label? Probably never. Huh. Uh, <laughs> because I recognized how difficult it was. I mean, I, if you, if listen, I ended up having my label. Right. Uh, I don't regret it. The five years I spent trying to do that, but I realized that it's something that I couldn't do. I it could either do one or the other really well. And for me, just making the music was the most important thing rather than trying to have a, a label with 10 artists and 10 different trajectories. It's very difficult. I didn't have the right partner either. So it was a situation where I got a label deal based largely on what I'd done with Atlantis and uh, I ended up just do, producing records for, for, the, for that label, not my label, but for the parent right. label. And they rarely would release any of my stuff. So it was it was the wrong fit. Let's jump to Alanis. You know, here's somebody who's sort of on the lowest totem pole for Maverick at the time. You know, Maverick's is, is still something of a starting label. Yeah. Um, they're struggling with their own management at the time. 
I would say that if you were to look at the who's looking list that labels were giving out, Alanis at the time was probably not the top name on the list when you were when you first met her. Um, that's no knock on her. It's just a sort of a in a weird sort of way. Maverick was this a new brand new well, label. Brand new label. You know, they they just didn't they didn't have what the other labels had. And here's this Canadian artist who has a quirky vibe. Why did you choose to work on Alanis? And you wrote the whole album pretty quickly, yeah. notoriously. So. Tell me about the process of writing Jagged Little Pill. I, I always think of myself as a songwriter first. And if somebody wants to write with me and they got some, something, some serious enthusiasm and any talent, I'm usually interested. Because for me, my thing is trying to find the special thing with my partner, even if they don't know that's what I'm looking for. I'm always listening to their voices. If I can get in a room with somebody who's a singer and I can hear their voice, it changes everything for me. Because I'm looking for the place where they have the most emotional resonance in their voice. And I'm, so I'm doing all this like kind of not sneakily, but I, I want to, I just feel like every person that I sit with has something special and I'm looking for that. I'm looking for the special thing, not the thing that's already out there. I, I never start from outside, go in. I always start inside and go out. And it's maybe harder, but I, I, I don't listen to what's going on out there. I don't. I would rather just make it around the artist. So uh, we, I've never tried to copy anything. And so it starts with a deep dive with an artist, trying to understand, hearing them sing in the room, and then shit happens. Yeah. Just hearing a voice, because you know it's their fingerprint, and you go, oh... Let's, let's make something out of that. So it was exactly that way with Alanis. I just thought of myself as a songwriter at that point, even though I, had, I was a successful record producer. I got a call from my publishers, a guy named John Alexander, MCA Music. And he said, I've got a, a, a writer in town from Ottawa. She, she had a record deal on MCA when she was 14. She's out of her deal, but we kept her publishing. Will you write a song with her? And the answer for me is always, almost always, yes. Let's do it. Really? It's oh, yeah. not. Oh, you, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a. The, uh, I know of a very successful songwriter who said to another very successful songwriter, "Like your hit writer, act like one." And I feel like some of that it has this connotation of that you got to start the power of no, and you say no to almost everything, and then you rarely say yes. I always say yes. Wow! Because yes to me is is a possibility. No shuts off all possibility. Yeah. Who taught you that? I, <laughs> Are your parents like that? It's just my mode. I mean, for me, first of all, anybody that's dropped out of normal life to do what we do, they're already freaks. And I consider myself to be a freak in that way and that I don't live a conventional life. And I, my passion for what we do is all consuming. And so if I meet somebody who has that kind of passion, I want, I want that. And I want to find out what they've got. And so for me getting a call from my publisher, they said, would I write with? Of course. That's what I do. If it doesn't work, what have you lost? A day? Sure. You probably have something at the end of it. Because I, for me, I always try to make sure that we have a song at the end of the day. Or at least we have something that we can call a song. What was the song you wrote with her? The first song I wrote with Alana is, well, I'll tell you about this meeting because it, it was an instant connection. I had a studio in Encino, California, and... She showed up, knocked on my door, 11 o'clock. We had a cup of tea, and I knew nothing about her. I had never heard her anything. And I, I just suggested that we write a song. And so I, I just threw out a concept. I said, there's a club in New York called The Bottom Line. All these great artists used to play there. Why don't we write a song about meeting at The Bottom Line, and The Bottom Line being this metaphoric bottom line of the relationship and she went and she like for her that was like an instant predicate for writing a song and so i picked up an acoustic guitar which was kind of unusual and we wrote a song called the bottom line and she wrote most of the lyric i helped her with a little bit of it and then we sang it and demoed it and 
it was like, shit, I like her voice a lot, a lot, a lot. There's something feral about it and something unusual. So we turned the song into MCA. They liked it. They sent her back to me. We wrote another song. And they sent her back like two weeks later. We wrote uh, the third song we wrote was a song called Ironic. And then she went back to Canada. And so they sent her back to LA in June. And we got together like eight more times. We wrote eight songs. She went back to Canada. She came back and we wrote a bunch more songs. But we got together 20 times. We wrote 20 songs. That's the only time I ever spent with it. And so um, 12 of those songs were on Jag a Little Pill. It's crazy. I mean, the the space between, um, well, we, we'll get to that song later, but the space between um, uh, Wilson Phillips to Jag Little Pill is actually pretty substantial. And you go from having, when you, it's easy to look at a discography and, and just scroll down and say, okay, yeah, there's yeah. there's a hit, there's a hit, there's a hit, but there's space between these Big these hits. Oh yeah, you, your expe- expectations after a few years start to change because for sure you've worked on other things that have been somewhat successful, somewhat not along the way, and you have to have some either moniker of doubt or or you know you have to at least question a little bit the process and the business because yeah. the business changes so rapidly and you have to start questioning yourself and whether or not maybe I don't know what a hit voice sounds like or what a hit song sounds like and it's just natural going into jagged little pill did you start questioning yourself am i projecting <laughs> or is there is there some part of you that was like this is you know that that doesn't really motivate you in in the creation in the creative process and it's you know it just happened to be as big as it was it if nothing had ever happened with it uh i would have still done it i would and i would do it again i mean for me the success comes after you've turned yourself inside out and if you're not willing to do that every single time for me that was the only way to go and because I'm so all in on it, there was no retreat. You just got to keep going. You just got to keep making music. And I mean, I write every day. So it, to me, it's like, if I'm not writing something every day, there's something wrong. So for me, it's like, now we get, I, will, I remain undaunted. And even the, between hits, you just try to survive. You just try to make music that you think is good. Uh, and look, if nothing had happened after 10 years, I, I would be forced to do something else. There's no question. But there was enough activity even between the times we didn't have a hit that it felt like we were moving towards something, you know. Did you have a personal life during any of this? My person, I listen, I was married and I had kids. So it, I was never a party guy. I was always a work guy. So I worked seven days a week and even when I... It, throughout all of that. And so my family was enormously supportive of it. You know, my two sons who are grown now, they were around all this music, you know, so, um, but they knew what my mode was, which is just making music. Yeah. So, um, We are celebrating the 25th anniversary of Jagged Little Pill. Amazing. Um, and we're celebrating by ending this year uh, by the time this comes out, last year. <laughs> um, but we're celebrating Jag Little Pill, the musical on Broadway, which opens tomorrow or uh, when this comes out a few months ago. <laughs> but this is a, it's hard to explain how complicated it is to get a show to Broadway. And, you know, the quick part of it is there are 39 theaters on Broadway, half of them are plays. Of the remaining half, half or more of them are legacy shows like, you know, Phantom of the Opera, Hamilton, Book of Mormon, so on and so forth. So you end up with about seven theaters. Half of those are going to be revivals. So you're going to have Oklahoma, you know, those kinds of things. So the remaining shows are basically Moulin Rouge, which costs $35 million plus, you know, Tina Turner, which costs $20 million plus. And then you have Jagged Little Pill, which is your musical on Broadway, written the book written by the... Academy Award winning Diablo Cody. Um, how is this process, you know, 
I know you had a show, which we can get to later a, a little bit, but you had a show, Ghost, that opened up based on the movie that you did with Dave Stewart that opened on Broadway. How does this differ from that? And what does it feel like now having multiple shows on Broadway? Well, first of all, deep gratitude, just based on what you're talking about. The shelf space is so limited for your product. Getting on the shelf, getting a theater is, like you say, is, is it's the hardest thing in the world. And so... First of all, just gratitude that that I do have this activity. I mean, it, the pro, as you well know, the process of getting something on stage, you have to shed all your sense of expectation in terms of how long it's going to take. Every show, I mean, first of all, Jagged Little Pill has been gestating for eight years, seven years, eight years. I had very little to do with the show other than I wrote the songs 25 years ago. I, I saw some of the workshops that they sent me. I saw the show in Boston. and But mostly, my involvement with it has just been at, at a distance. And so this one is a complete gift to me. I'm just reminded that the commitment that we made to writing those songs is on some level is paying us back now because... When we wrote those songs, we were just trying to please each other. We had no supervision. There was no record company. There was nobody. It was two of us in a room. And the fact that these songs have now found a new life with these incredible, incredibly gifted people like Diablo Cody and Diane Paulus, who've taken this music and reconfigured it in a way, it's actually astonishing to me. So for me, Jagged Little Pill, the musical, is is like a Christmas present. How does it compare to a show like Ghost, which you wrote from scratch? Those songs are written from scratch, which takes... Explain the process yes. of writing a Broadway show, because I've tried, but you've done it now a, a, a few times, and it's trying to explain the the intricacies in the process of developing a show is so complex. What is the difference from doing Ghost and now you have a show that's in the West End right now, right? No, it's or, going on Manchester. Uh, oh, Manchester. Which, yeah, we have Back to the Future going up uh, and it will eventually be on the West End. So explain it, you know, the yeah, process of the, all these different musicals. Well, I mean, for me, as a songwriter, first of all... Um, it's enormously liberating. It's enormously liberating because the pop music box is, is a much smaller box now musically, smaller than it's ever been. So for me, it's liberation from that little box. Mostly you can use all the vocabulary of music to tell your story on stage. So right away, I'm liberated. But... It's it, And I also love the fact that of all the art forms, it gets the most, you work it out the most. I mean, it's really funny. I'm, I've just shot eight episodes of a TV series. We didn't rehearse any scenes. We did table readings and then we shot. In theater, you work this stuff up for months. You do workshops, you... You audition things. And so the process for some people is extremely daunting because it because you audition so many things. But for me, it's liberation because you have the time and the space to actually figure out how to make it work. And you can actually rehearse it. And you can see it in front of you and go, oh, no, that doesn't work. There's almost no other medium where you have that kind of revision. Of, everything gets revised. Even when you're in previews, you get to revise it. But back to the whole process, I mean, it's, you, have to, you have to shed all sense of, of what you think the timeline can be. You just can't, you can't be sitting around looking at your watch. You can't, or the calendar even. So the commitment is so deep. If you don't believe in it, it you will wash out. So it, the process is daunting, but it's, if you, like me, want to write real music, it's, it opens up the door. The, you know, bringing what you learn from the theater into the pop world is fascinating because that idea of of what do you really want to say 
making sure every lyric has a purpose, making sure the song delivers in that artist life. Do you find yourself using any of the knowledge you know from doing things like television and and film, you know, you won a Grammy for Polar Express, you know. Do you have writing for film, writing for theater, does that influence how you write for oh, absolutely. other artists? Because you, you have a real clearly defined purpose always in front of you. Or if it's a film, you have all these beautiful pictures and story. So I, I think it in every way, uh, I, will, I don't want to say it's easier, but the predicates are all there. I mean, the, th- the reason to be doing it is there. So it, you, you're never lacking the inspiration in those media. You, you really aren't. When you're sitting around trying to write a pop record, it's a completely different process. You're, you're basically trying to get something today that's, that sounds like a lot of everything else, but it's only different. Um, uh, going back in time a little bit to to some, for some of the more disc, the discography questions, um, you know, Nine Lives for Aerosmith, you know, that comes off of Get a Grip, which was probably their biggest success. You know, um, having the the sort of commercial expectations for following up Get a Grip, how? Um, how was it working with Aerosmith during a time where they had just followed up some, you know, was it hard for them to follow up that, did they feel this pressure during, during the writing recording process? I, 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 I yes, the answer, the, the simple answer is yes, but they were going through, I mean, look, there was, there was some internal dynamics in the band that weren't great at that time, but at the end of the day, it's probably the, the most fun I've ever had. <laughs> yeah. We spent six months in Miami Beach. We lived at the Marlin Hotel. Steven Tyler was in 206. I was in 205. And just the act of writing with Steven, as much as I did, is it's an incredible experience. Because when I, th- I say I love to hear a singer sing, Steven can sing for 12 hours. And he, his voice never gets tired. And he can do the most amazing shit with his voice. So for me, as a writer, it was I was always having fun. It must and, be so fun recording a voice like that with all the overtones oh, and all that. Like he's just has such a unique tone. He's one of the greatest singers, and it, it people don't recognize it as much yeah. because, I mean, he can even do this tuba singing where he sings through his nose. And I mean, the man has. He's so. Listen, we felt all that weight of like, you got to have another hit. Or, is this a hit? Is this not a hit? I try to protect the artist I'm working with from too much of that stress. I try to take it on myself and let them just be creative. And yeah, I was feeling it. I mean, John Kalodner was our A&R guy and I, I love John so much. And it was, you know, th- there's a lot of pressure there, but you can't bring that to the artist. You can't. Sure. You can't. Um, Two other projects that are really interesting right after that, you know, Return of Saturn for No Doubt really kind of cements their place. You know, they had had a single that worked and then they had an album that, you know, Tragic Kingdom that was just massive. And they have like Return of Saturn really solidifies them in the the pop, punk, punk rock world. Um, but that also feels a little bit out of the box musically. Yeah, compared to anything else that you had done. Well, I didn't have anything to do with the writing of that record. And I think um, that was, before they even hired me to do it, they wanted to make a record that they wrote. So even though Jimmy Iovine really encouraged them to write with me, they weren't open to it. So basically I just took their material and arranged it and tried to make a hit record out of it. so it it is different in that respect because it's their music and I'm just the producer. Yeah, but it worked. I love the record. Yeah. You know, love it. Um, Dave Matthews Band Every Day. You know, for anybody who's about my age who learned how to play guitar, Dave Matthews is the most influential guitarist f- for almost every songwritery kind of yeah. guitar player. Um, this was a famous album for him 
partly because it was abandoning acoustic guitar and being able to really embrace electric guitar. Um, is that was that a conversation between the two of you? What brings you know that's sort of his Bob Dylan moment of okay, yeah. I'm going to do an album that's electric guitar, and his fans like I don't know what to do, I don't know how to consume it, and then you have space between, you have a bunch of hits on it. But how do you you know that conversation of taking an artist for maybe the one of the more pivotal pivotal moments of one of the biggest artists you worked with? Well, first of all, there was some reaction from the hardcore base about that electric and sort of more commercial or whatever they wanted to call it. It all happened naturally. I I was, look, they are a famous jam band and they're famously, uh, they were famously sort of slow making their records. So they were in the middle of making a record with Steve Lillywhite in their studio in Virginia. And they'd been working on it for like a year and they had nothing recorded at the end of a year. So I was called in basically to take that music that they had written. And most of the songs in, were in various forms, but most of them were like seven and eight minutes long, like, which is what they do. They're a jam band. So I took all of that material. I went out and met the, Dave and the band in Connecticut. And they're like meeting this guy from the outside it's a very insulated group and you know it's so they were really enormously embracing to allow, allow me in and the attitude was this is the fixer this guy's going to come in and arrange your shit and you get and we'll make a record out of it cuz we need a record this year so i got all the material and i went back to la and i it just i went about doing my edits and and sort of just making four minute versions out of eight minute songs, which is what I did on all the material. I think it was like eight songs. So the attitude, the idea was that they, because they tour all the time, they only had five weeks to make this record, five weeks, and they had already spent a year making it. So I was going to start over and make a record in five weeks. We needed two more songs. So the attitude was Dave will come out and write with me for a week. We'll get the other two songs and we'll make the record. He came out. We got in the studio and we proceeded to write 12 songs in seven days. It's, I actually have never had anything like that happen. I sat and I gave him a baritone electric guitar and we sat in my studio and we caught fire and we wrote all those songs in a week, mm-hmm. a week. And so the band came back a week later and I mean, my thing is to make the demos right when we're doing it. So we had really good demos in this week. We got them into my studio and said, okay, Dave said, I, I have a couple of new songs I want to play. And he played them all this new material and they were just like, they never heard it. And so Dave said, I want to do these songs. And they went, uh, how are we going to do that? And now we have a month to make this record. But they were so game about it. And so we went into the studio uh, and I, we made this record. Yeah, crazy. Um, You know, after this, you obviously, you end up working with some artists really early on in their careers, Miley, Katy Perry, you know, you're still meeting these artists really early and still saying yes. Yes. Um, but there's one name of a of a fellow classic writer that you're friends with, and I I guess I'm not sure when you guys met, but um, a, going into our next segment, which will be five for five, I'm gonna name five names, and you just tell me the first five things that come off the top. We're gonna start with this one, Dave Stewart, oh from the Eurythmics. I love Dave so much. His spirit is infectious. Uh. He's one of my favorite guitar players. I, I love him like a brother. He's he's the greatest. He's the most fun person I've ever worked with. Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones is like my father figure. He's all love. He's a genius. And he's so confident in his genius that he empowers other people on a regular basis. So I owe my career to Quincy Jones, no doubt. Wilson Phillips. I love them like they're my daughters, 
I love them so much. Uh, we were very close. I mean, they, they had these famous parents who weren't always great to them. And I sort of, I, hopefully I filled in a little bit in terms of being a solid presence in their life. And the first time I heard them sing, they, they sang the song, Release Me. And I was, I, I said, that you don't have three voices there. That's one voice. And for me, the sound that they made in the room was all I needed. It was like, okay, let's make a record based on that. So I love them to this moment. They're the greatest. Alanis Morissette. Alanis Morissette. A smiling genius who shows up at my door at the age of 19, who was an open channel and who's, I would use the word alacrity to describe her. She was so present in a way that was astonishing. And it was, I think, uh, serendipitous that we were in the same room together 20 times and the magic that that we were able to create is still there let's go with marty mcfly marty mcfly oh great well i am doing back to the future for the for the stage and marty mcfly is you know he's going to go back to 1955 and i i'm trying to help him get there (laughs) exactly um and a shout out to Malia Savet, our fellow friend. Oh, so we have to shout, give her a shout out to out. Malia. She's one of my favorite singers, such a dynamic performer. Just kudos to her. And the fact that we both are connected to her is serendipity. Yeah. Um, excited for her music to come out in 2020. But, um, you know, I got to, first of all, thank you for doing this. Thank you. Um, I feel like I can ask you questions all day and talk to you about music because you think of music as um, not necessarily as just you know the top 40 chart but you think of music and music is so vast and it doesn't have to be a chase over you know certain loops and dealing with interpolations and all the parts that are a part of the music industry now and and it is important to know all of what's happening in the world right now, but it's also important to respect music of all different genres and to use that music in creating new music as um, you know, as a way to progress. You kind of have to understand where music came from. And your discography just speaks to an understanding of music and it's such a, an inspiring way. And you don't know this, but I met Dave Stewart... 10 years ago. I don't know if he remembers this, but we went to your studio in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh you know my one of my good friends and I who we still write with uh, together, we went and we were just so green. Both of us were, you know, he's the SNL guitarist, Jared Sharf, shout out to him, Pro Line producer, and I you know, and I was in a band and we were just starting to co-write and somehow Dave Stewart brings us in and he brings us inside your studio and it's all white. You know, it's my studio. It was all white and it had it was all white except for the Grammys that were sitting out. And it was such a so was, you you focus on those Grammys and you see that grand piano and you just look at it and you think, okay, this person is starting with a, a literal canvas. Creating a white room is is a is a space where the only thing that paints the room are the words and the music. And I just remember seeing that, and whether you that was intentional or not, I think about that image a ton. Oh my god! You Amazing. know the idea that our job is to paint. You know, our job is to create music that didn't exist before that helps tell a story, because that's what we're inspired to do. And if you do what you did with Alanis, and you just write songs for each other, then maybe out there there's there are other people who can see themselves in that because that's where honesty comes from. That's where all of it comes from. But, um, you know, again, I can't thank you enough for doing this. This is really exciting. And uh, congratulations on the opening of Jag Little Pill, the musical. Thanks Go so see much. It. All right. Thanks, Ross. Thanks for listening to this episode of And the Writer Is... If you want to hear music from this songwriter I just interviewed, 
be sure to check out our Spotify playlist or visit our website at andthewriteris.com. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to us. You can also like us on Facebook and Twitter. And the Writer Is is produced by Joe London, edited by Miles Bergsma, and published by Big Deal Music. A special thanks to David Silberstein from Mega House Music and Michael White. Until next time, this is Ross Golan.